Welcome to the conversation. I'm back. I'm Carrie Ann, and with me, I will be joined by Jared, our resident astronomer, Mike, our rocket specialist, and of course, Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. Although I say, of course, I don't actually mean of course, with special guest, Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. I hope that's a little bit better. He wanted a really long <laughs> title. Uh, Dodd is actually on vacation this week, so we've gone ahead and locked Ben in on the bridge so he can press all of the buttons. Uh, today in news, we have Tim. <laughs> well, orbital, orbital ATK and Space Division of Northrop Grumman Cygnus spacecraft, aka the Space Keg, finally made it to the International Space Station. Nice. Jay. And also, we've got some new telescopes and some new results from new telescopes. <laughs> Very exciting. We're going to get to launches, and then in our third segment, we of course are going to look back at your comments and questions about last week's show. This is Tomorrow Orbit 10.43. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? I apologize, I'm a little bit rusty, but of course at the top of the show, I wanna make sure I give a huge shout out and thank you to our Patreon supporters. These are of the Escape Velocity variety. They get a whole bunch of things. I really, I, there's almost too much to name. I've got the entire list in front of me and it is so many different things. Uh, but I, one of my favorite things is voting rights and upcoming round table discussions. Uh, you of course get your name in the show in all three segments. If you are interested in these things and more, head on over to patreon.com slash tm RO. So, so many things. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I need to like pick and choose and then, uh, you know, kind of go with that every single week. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> like I said, I apologize. I'm a little bit rusty. I have been around. I've been watching. Uh, you guys have been doing a really great job without us here. So thank you to all of you for all of their hard work on that. Uh, and we, of course, like to start off our shows with launches, assuming there have been in the last week and there have been in the last week, which is so very yeah. exciting. So, uh, Mr. Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you. What is of the uh, what's our launch situation this last week? Well, we actually had three launches with this week, one of which actually happened early this morning. But let's start in chronological order with an Antares launch that happened earlier this week on Sunday. Perfect. Three, two, one. And we have ignition. Not gonna lie, with that footage and that, that noise, it made it sound like we were burning people alive. That was very disturbing and I did not like it at all. <laughs> and yet they were happy about it. They were happy about it though. It's all good, no worries, no worries. Well, with this launch, this uh, happened, uh, like I said, on Sunday, November 12th at 12.19 Coordinated Universal Time from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, which is in uh, Virginia's Wallops Island on the east coast of the United States. Now, uh, it was uh, the, carrying the Cygnus spacecraft, which had three point seven tons of cargo, supplies, and experiments uh, heading for the International Space Station. And the two Russian-built RD-181 engines performed as expected, and the uh, upper solid stage, the Castor 30XL upper stage, performed as expected. And Orbital ATK, a space division of North of Grumman, christened the Cygnus cargo carrier the SS Gene Cernan after the late astronaut who died back in January of this year. Now, this was the eighth cargo mission, or operational cargo mission, for Orbital ATK since their contract started in January of 2014. And you could see there the, uh, the birthing operations that happened at the space station just a couple days later. But we'll talk more in detail about that a little bit later. But uh, uh, everything was able to go successfully with this launch. I'm glad to see an Antares launch, and hopefully they'll get some more customers soon for that rocket as well. And very happy to see this, this go off. There's going to be uh, keeping the Cygnus at the space station for a little under a month before doing some tests. And then they're going to have a couple of more CubeSats that are going to deploy from the Cygnus spacecraft after it has departed from the space station. So congratulations to everyone involved at Orbital ATK, a space division of North of Grumman. <laughs> <laughs> you, will, you will hear that, uh, that title at least one more time in this show, yes. which is really amazing. <laughs> okay, so oh there were other launches, though. Uh, there was a Long March 4C launch. That's a, such mm -hmm. a funny title to me, Yeah, too. there was. 
go ahead. <laughs> well, yeah, they have all their different kinds. And this one is kind of the single, um, it doesn't have any side uh, uh, booster rockets, but it is a three-stage liquid rocket. Okay. And uh, the, the Long March 4C, uh, this launched on uh, November 14th, carrying a new weather satellite for the uh, Chinese Meteorological Association. Nice. What we can see here, uh, this was a little bit of a preparations for that, and it launched into a 500-mile high or 800-kilometer polar orbit tilted 98.7 degrees to the equator, at least according to tracking data released by the U.S. military. Now, uh, with this successful launch, uh, the primary payload was called the Feng Yun 3D uh, spacecraft. And the way that it was going to be monitoring their, uh, the atmosphere is with 10 instruments that are going to be tracking cloud and storm movements, ozone health, greenhouse gas gases. And the, the Chinese Meteorological Administration said that everything about this was a successful launch and they had successful deployment of the satellite itself. Now, there was also, interestingly, a uh, microsatellite that also deployed with this launch which uh, I have a feeling uh, someone that we know very well is secretly uh, involved with this because uh, there was a maritime tracking satellite called Head One, which was built by a, a company called Head Aerospace based in China. And uh, they're going to be deploying about a constellation of 30 of these kind of uh, micro satellites to check out uh, maritime tracking data. So I think our own Jared Head has some sort of secret Chinese space company. This is messed up, dude. Why didn't you tell us? Dude, no wonder why you've been so freaking busy all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's why I've been been like not on Twitter a lot of late is because I've been you know I've been I jumped in my my BFS and flew to Shanghai in 30 minutes after every show to to just do this uh, so that cuts down on Twitter time yeah, yeah it, it really cuts into your it really cuts into it so. stupid sorry sorry so my question is is why do you want to track ships I, mean, I figured it would be some sort of astronomy thing it's just, <laughs> I'm just confusing as all. I was trying to do a Christmas gift and and not let you guys know wait, but wait, now wait, the wait, cat's wait. out of the bag did you now. say gift or gift oh I'm Either sorry one of I just spoiled it <laughs> I just spoiled it. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, anyway, we did have one more launch this week. <laughs> Perfect. Good. Segue into that. Keep going. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, this launch uh, happened early this morning, and it's a launch that we've been looking forward to for quite a while, but it was delayed a couple of times. But, of course, it's always better to be safe than sorry when it comes you know, to glitches and weather and wayward planes and boats and all that sort of thing. We're talking about the second-to-last Delta II launch, and it finally went off this morning. Let's check it out. Three, two, engine start, one, and liftoff of Delta II and NOAA's Joint Polar Satellite System 1, making the U.S. a more weather-ready nation. Now, this launch took place at 9.47 Coordinated Universal Time from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. And uh, the payload, as, as the announcer said, was uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Joint Polar Satellite System. Number one, the first of four upgraded observatories that are de designed to keep, you know, really vital meteorological data flowing to the you know, weather forecasters for the next uh, two decades. It does have a seven-year mission, but it is expected to run even longer than that in conjunction with the GOES satellites and future joint polar satellite system satellites in the future. Now, uh, the government-owned uh, weather satellite was deployed into an orbit about 500 miles or 800 kilometers above the Earth, kind of in a similar uh, orbit that the Chinese weather satellite was actually put in. And just... It's, it's a little bit emotional to have this being the second to last Delta II launch, and it also placed uh, five secondary CubeSats into orbit with the, their P-Pods, or uh, payload uh, deployment boxes that they have, uh, that they've been using on the Centaur upper stage. So cool to see that with the Delta upper stage as well. And, oh man, maybe there might be another customer, because there is one more rocket after the last one that's scheduled to, to launch of the Delta II series. There is one more that they could potentially put together for one more customer, unless, you know, they restart the, uh, the manufacturing and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, it looks like there's only going to be one more Delta II rocket launch before that family is retired. So <sighs> mixed feelings about it, you know? So um, being the rocket specialist and me just being the co-host, uh, <laughs> tell me why you are sad to see this particular family of rockets being retired. 
You know, it's not like the uh, the Delta II is like the most affordable rocket or anything like that for the type of missions it has for that kind of um, medium, you know, light to medium range uh, payload range for for missions. But the the heritage of the Delta II, you know, goes all the way back to the 1960s with the Thor ICBMs, and it's just been slowly upgraded and upgraded and upgraded. And you know, different engines that they used on you know uh, uh, some upper stages for like the Vanguard and uh, Jupiter series of rockets, you know, became the upper stage of the Delta rocket. And that's why it's called the Delta rocket, actually, is because of the, the upper stage. The, the first stage of the rocket is still technically a Thorad ICBM or an upgraded Thorad ICBM, technically. So it's, it's, it's actually a Thor rocket, but we call it the Delta rocket. And so it's just got a really long, interesting history of how this rocket has developed over the years. And so I guess that's why it's, it's bittersweet for me, because it has such a cool history and you know we've been able to upgrade these rocket engines that we were using right from the beginning of, of the, the space age and uh, we won't be using those anymore after this so yeah that's why it's bittersweet to me and not to make you uh, continue to talk about things that you didn't realize I was gonna make you talk about uh, but why is this being <laughs> why why is it being retired for those people who don't know and you know uh, to, to my understanding, they just don't. Uh, United Launch Alliance doesn't necessarily have uh, the customers for that particular rocket, and they're trying to phase out their entire family of rockets. Not only the Delta II, but the Delta IV and Delta Heavies eventually, and the Atlas V series of rockets to uh, be replaced by their Vulcan uh, family of rockets. So gotcha. um, it's just kind of, and, and even with Vulcan, the way that they market their Vulcan rocket is it's all the best parts of Atlas and uh, Delta put together. So in a way, you know, all this rocket engine heritage and, and technology heritage is still kind of going to be transferred over to the Vulcan rocket. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's just simply wanting to upgrade their fleet of, of rockets and have something that's a little bit more uh, cost effective, especially uh, considering their primary competitor. And, uh, yeah, to... That's that's pretty much the reason. Gotcha. All right. Cool. Uh, uh, Dan TC twenty four in the chat room is asking. So ULA is just paring down to one rocket. You said fam Vulcan family of rockets, though, right? Because there's a couple, kind of like a, well, the just like with how the Atlas five, how the Atlas five has like different configurations of it. You know, different numbers of solid boosters and stuff like that. Different number of engines on the upper stage. The Vulcan's going to be the same thing. So mm -hmm. they're going to have a whole. You know, it's going to be you know one rocket, but there's going to be so many different configurations of it. Different payload fearing sizes. They two different payload fairing sizes, different number of uh, solid rocket boosters that they'll have with it. And then they'll be using the Centaur upper stage at first, but they'll transition over to their Aces upper stage. And even that looks like there's going to be different you know, versions of that, of how many numbers of engines it has. And so it's going to be the same rocket, but there's going to be so many different versions of it that we're going to actually have to specify which version it is once Vulcan actually does start launching. Got it. All right. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys. Uh, I, I, you know, I figured while we were talking about it, we might as well dive a little bit deeper into yeah. it. Uh, I know normally <laughs> we don't uh, go quite that deep into launches and news, but uh, I, I figured that was a good time for that. Oh, that's... <laughs> Perfect. And, yeah. and thank you, Mike, for, for dancing, as I asked. So I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I hope that, hope that was a good answer. <laughs> yeah, no, it was great. Uh, I feel like I learned something today. Uh, Mr. Jared, yes. to uh, transition ever so slightly into news, you have some uh, interesting telescope news. Yeah. How weird coming from you. Yeah, how bizarre that I would talk <laughs> about telescopes. Who would, have, who would have thought that I, the, the sole astronomer on tomorrow, would, uh, would end up doing that? Well... Yes, yes, telescopes. Perfect. Uh, specifically one located in the mountains near San Diego called Palomar Observatory, which is one of the most productive astronomical telescopes in the world. Um, now, since 2009, Palomar's transient factory has operated. Sounds like a really cool place. Um, this is actually a specialized mm -hmm. telescope that looks at a very large patch of the sky for changes in light. And Palomar is excellent for this because it has three primary telescopes. You can see um, in this picture right here. The 48-inch Samuel Ocean Telescope over on your left right there, the 60-inch telescope over on your right, and then the 200-inch Hale telescope right in the middle of it. Now, um, what was so cool about the Palomar Transient Factory is that it, it, it operated on the 48-inch Samuel Ocean Telescope, which is a autonomous telescope. It basically does it all by itself. Now, follow-up observations are then made by the 60-inch if the 48-inch finds something really interesting. That 60-inch is also automated as well. And then if this event warrants further detailed 
field observation. They operate, they fire up the 200 inch hail telescope and call it into action to take a look. But of course, all good things must come to an end, especially as technology advances and progresses as, as, an, as it rapid as a rate that it does, especially um, in astronomy. But it's going to be replaced by a new instrument that's actually going to be giving us an even larger, more detailed view of the sky. And this is called the Zwicky Transient Facility Telescope. And it's named after Caltech's first astrophysicist, Fritz Zwicky, who proposed the idea of dark matter back when the physics of it were not even particularly well understood back in the 1930s. So the ZTF will take images of the sky that are roughly 47 square degrees in size. That's basically the same size as about 250. 50 full moons on the sky, and it does that all at once at a resolution of 24,000 by 24,000 pixels. So every single night it will generate four terabytes of data, which Caltech has developed a special software called IPAC uh, that views these images, makes determinations as to what targets uh, are worth further study, and then actually puts that into, uh, into fruition with the 60 inch and the 200 inch uh, at Palomar Observatory. So ZTF is going to start its calibration and testing phase in February of 2018, and it should come online for scientific research starting in 2020. So uh, super cool instrument that's coming up, and they're finally getting ready to do it. Uh, that's going to replace an already super productive instrument, um, and really looking forward to all the data that we get from that. So. Is there going to be like a... Uh, uh Oh, what's the word I want? Uh, but like a ceremony of like like oh. a big party? Yeah. Uh, probably not. What? Probably not. That's so. stupid. Hey, <laughs> hey, want to go down? We'll yeah, go. we should all go. We should. We should do that. Let's get in touch with Palomar and yeah. uh, and we'll we'll stream the event. Obviously, right? So yeah. Hey, uh, sounds like a plan. Wavelength Brewery. We got to get them there. <gasps> oh my uh, gosh, right? we could. Yeah. This, we could. Right. All right. Sorry. This is a party. <laughs> right? it, it is now. Uh, brainstorm uh, on air is what you're watching live. Uh, all right. Well, so, Tim, now that we're talking about uh, beer and parties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I figured that was the best segue Good. for our space, space keg right? uh, story. Tell me what's going on there. <laughs> Well, the space keg, as Mike mentioned, did make it to the International Space Station. I wanted to take a quick little second to, to go into that a little bit deeper. Now, this is, of course, Orbital ATK, a space division of Northrop Grumman's Cygnus spacecraft. Love it. Uh, it. It arrived at the International Space Station Tuesday morning um, following that successful Antares launch on Sunday that Space Mike talked about. Um, uh, I, people in the chat room already pointed out that this is not the right picture. This is uh, an older version, uh, but... It was beautiful, so I'm sorry. You can see the kegginess of it. I, th I think that's good. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Very much so, the kegginess of it. Uh, this, the Cygnus spacecraft, uh, yeah, it was named after, you know, Gene Cernan, uh, who was the last person to walk on the moon. And this gets there by guiding itself uh, to the ISS using GPS and laser navigation sensors. Um, and it successfully gra was grappled by, by the ISS's uh, Canada arm, or Canadarm, if you're pedantic, at <laughs> 10.04 UTC by astronaut... Paolo Nespoli. I'm sure I said that very wrong. Um, but later that day on Tuesday, crew members aboard, on board the ISS opened the hatch a day earlier than planned. That's always a good sign. Mm -hmm. But they have a lot of work ahead. They need to unload 3,200 kilograms or 7,100 pounds of cargo, including crew supplies, science experiments, spacewalk equipment, vehicle hardware, and computer resources. They're actually even going to be taking some of the uh, they're going to be using it as a temporary workstation for a little bit, moving some equipment back into it, which is pretty cool. I don't know if that's been done before yet on a Cygnus. Um, but there's some cool experiments on board, but one that I really like is this Tech, uh, tech EdSat 6, which is um, an experimental CubeSat that is working on a way to deorbit itself quicker using an exobrake drag device. Um, this helps eliminate, you know, so there's not as much space junk. You know, that's always a big concern is all the space debris. But having, like, this, this cool little exobrake on the back um, hopefully helps it deorbit itself uh, rather quickly. They're working on that instead of using propulsive to, propulsion to bring it down. Um, this is a concept, so I think that's kind of cool. And uh, following the successful mission, it will be packed full of trash, and it will burn up on reentry. This is an actual picture of Cygnus reentering. Uh, notice that it's very much on fire and very much flamey and, and, <laughs> and exploding. It's kind of a cool and picture, And that's though. on purpose. It's a very cool picture. Uh, and they do this on purpose. This is meant to be... Um, entirely disposed of, which is 
Um, they discard it. So this, this is how you basically do trash on the International Space Station. You huck it at Earth and you let it blow up. Um, <laughs> this is opposite of SpaceX's Dragon Capsule. They have both a pressurized and an unpressurized section. So they have the, the actual capsule itself, which is pressurized and can be recovered for experiments and things like that. But SpaceX also has that unpressurized trunk, which does a similar thing to discard trash. And, and they just stick stuff in there and let it burn up on reentry. So, but the Cygnus only does that. So that's a, a little different. So, yeah. Something else that go. was a little bit interesting, if I may, about this mission is that um, before, after they've unloaded it with trash and unberthed it from the station, right now it's berthed to the uh, Unity module, which is one of the first U.S. modules. And what they're going to do after they unberth it is they're going to move it around towards some of the, the actual docking ports, not the berthing ports, but the docking ports that they've been making all the upgrades to in preparation for the SpaceX Dragon vehicle and the Boeing CST-100 vehicle for commercial crews. And the reason that they're doing this is to use the equipment on board, like you uh, you were kind of mentioning about uh, doing some tests on, on board the vehicle, to check out all the, D, uh, the GPS and uh, laser guide, guidance systems to make sure that uh, the equipment on there, which is going to be uh, similar equipment to what's going to be used on the Starliner and the Dragon crew vehicles, that all of that will work, that the International Space Station's hardware will communicate with that hardware so that, you know, in the test flights coming up next year, that hopefully everything will go well. So I just thought that that was a really interesting uh, thing that they're doing with uh, uh, Cygnus to further along the commercial crew program as well. Yeah, that yeah, nice. that's very cool. I'll always leave it to Mike to uh, give us that extra little push on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Mike, we're going to make you talk some more. Uh, Sierra Nevada, not to be confused with the beer company, uh, completes the Dream Chaser test flight. <laughs> hey, uh, that's that's a thing. I've that's got true. a lot of questions about that over the years. Uh, so, uh, Mike, tell us a little bit more about Dream Chaser and what's going on over there. Yeah, so um, last Saturday on uh, um, uh, November 11th, uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation, or rather the uh, space systems uh, of Sierra Nevada Corporation, conducted a successful uh, drop test and free flight of their Dream Chaser space plane. And there's just some beautiful footage of the morning of. And this was at Edwards Air Force Base, or the uh, 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 now renamed uh, NASA Armstrong uh, Flight uh, Test Research Center. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also still Edwards Air Force Base, but you know, this was part of the NASA Armstrong uh, testing as well. Okay. Anyway, the spacecraft, uh, or rather this atmospheric test vehicle of the spacecraft, was uh, carried aloft by a helicopter connected by a 200-foot cable or 60-meter cable, and then it was positioned for its drop. Now, the onboard guidance computer was expected to manu maneuver all of the aero surfaces and ailerons on the vehicle so that it could be able to glide down to the runway and make its very steep final approach and still have a successful landing. And, you know, we here it is ongoing right now. You can see the drop there. Now, uh, with this, once it was able to get down to the landing, the two main landing gears uh, that had the wheels on it and the nose skid did deploy successfully just before touchdown. The last time that they tried to do a drop test like this four years ago in 2013, one of the landing gear, one of the wheeled landing gear, did not fully deploy, and the vehicle, you know, pretty much rolled over and rolled to a stop and had a bunch of damage, but was able to survive. And they did get a lot of really good data from that test. Now, uh, with this test, however, uh, the company officials did say that the test vehicle um, had a lot of the uh, space-rated avionics and flight software. And there you go. You can see the nice landing right mm -hmm. there. Whew, finally successful. Um, and so all the flight software that was on board to have this be a, an automated landing uh, is the same type of hardware that they're going to be using in the future, hopefully someday for a crewed version of this or for what they have been redesigning the vehicle for, which is a crew or rather a cargo vehicle uh, that they won an award for from NASA in January of last year, 2016, to send up at least six round trip cargo flights to the space station and be able to return hardware back to a, a runway landing like this, kind of like how uh, the Dragon cargo spacecraft is able to splash down in the ocean and return sensitive hardware and experiments and all that other thing. So this was very cool that they were able to uh, complete this test. And there's some other things on, on in the future as well for uh, Sierra Nevada and the Dream Chaser space plane. They have an agreement with the European Space Agency to do some kind of, some sort of like free flying missions that had just a bunch of experiments on board the, the Dream Chaser that would fly around in orbit, kind of like how the, the, the X-37B uh, space 
space plane stays on orbit for a little while, although completely different types of experiments. Uh, beyond that, they're also going to be doing some uh, free-flying experiments for the United Nations as well. And uh, they're going to be sending up a mission in 2021 to host payloads from developing nations that either don't have the funds or don't have the capability to organize uh, some sort of space mission on their own. So I thought that that was really cool. And it could lead to more things in the future. You know, the Germans are interested. Uh, the European Space Agency as a whole is interested. And even the UN is interested in potentially working this vehicle into a crew vehicle as it was originally intended to be once again. So I love space planes. I love the Dream Chaser space plane, you know, the mini space shuttle, and very happy happy to see that this test was finally successful and that they can move forward to the program and at least we'll see the cargo version of this space plane flying. So very cool and very, very good news. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A, lot of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people in the chat room are like, oh, that's a really good looking space plane. Which yeah, is, it is. <laughs> yeah. Lifting bodies and they got curves. Oh, so. wow. Well then. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Mr. Jared. Uh, yeah, that, that footage too, they, they're that they just panning around this thing. Like we need to, there needs to be some really awesome music. We need to make a music video out of that footage totally. right there. <laughs> totally, I, totally. I do have one quick question that yes. I want to bring up uh, that I haven't, that I didn't realize until you were talking, Mike. I didn't realize, are they only actually physically building one of these and they're going to be reusing it over and over? I, I guess I, you know, I'm so used to capsules where they build multiple or is this literally <laughs> one and they're going to do it six times right. for the different missions? For, for this, this vehicle that we saw is not going to be flying in space. This was just their atmospheric test article. And if, if you do some research there, they're talking about like where they want to house it, whether or not they want to like, they want to put it in a museum essentially. Uh, but they may or may not do some more tests with this particular vehicle, but this particular one will not fly in space. Um, the, the, Mark Sarangelo has said at one point that if they do uh, work out some sort of contract or some sort of deal to have a crewed version of the Dream Chaser space plane, they may or may not refit this one to be uh, a crew vehicle, but they're going to be building an entirely new vehicle to be the cargo version. And to my understanding, I believe that they were going to be uh, making two Two cargo flight worthy versions um, and they would just be reusing those two vehicles over and over again one of them was going to be the primary one and the other one is just going to be a backup one but that was like a year ago when they, like when they first you know won the cargo contract that I was reading that so I don't know if that plan with Sierra Nevada is still in effect or whether or not they're just going to build one cargo vehicle but from my understanding they were going to be building two vehicles and if they ever do get the crew vehicle version again they'll either refit this one that we saw the atmospheric test vehicle or they'll just build a brand new one that would be up to specs for a crude you know a human rated space plane very cool nice yeah. does that answer that. your question yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. nice there you go. So, cool cool mr jared yes uh, i actually read this title as saying hitomi short bus and I was very confused for Not a second. Quite. Uh, <laughs> short but productive run yeah. makes way more sense. So I, I'm glad I took the second to read that one again. Uh, what's going over? Uh, what's going on in, uh, with JAXA, Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency? Oh, there you Thank go. you for spelling that out for you me. You said it, so I don't have to say it again. <laughs> so yeah, JAXA's Hitomi X-ray Space Telescope mission. Uh, it didn't last very long on orbit due to a software error um, on board. But that very small amount of data that we got back has been really, really rich in discoveries, and one announced this week basically continues to confirm our understa understanding of the formation of the elements within our universe. And one of the few targets that Hitomi did observe during that very short period when it was observing was the Perseus Cluster, one of the most massive nearby cluster of galaxies, being only a hop, skip, and a jump of 240 million light years away. Now, over those two weeks, Hitomi took nearly three and a half days worth of exposure in X-rays, specifically with this, this instrument that we see a photo of right here, which is called the Soft X-ray Spectrometer. It's an instrument that breaks down X-ray light to find the signatures of elements, and the S X. S instrument is the most advanced of its kind to have ever flown in the space. It has 30 times higher resolution than previous X-ray spectrometers. And what was seen with the data shows us that things like white dwarf stars produce elements that we expect them to, such as chromium, iron, and nickel. But white, white dwarf stars form these elements in what are typically known as type 1a supernovae. Uh, these kinds of supernovae occur when two white dwarfs collide and annihilate each other, or a white dwarf pulls material off of its binary companion, eventually reaches a mass where it ignites and then it annihilates itself. So that SX 
S instrument also found a very precise match of elemental composition with stars similar to our sun. This is something that we had no reason to doubt, uh, but it's just really nice to have the data that basically says that it is. Now, a software error led to Hitomi spinning out of control and spinning so fast uh, that it literally broke apart in March of 2016. Um, and NASA, which provided the SXS instrument, and JAXA have already agreed to fly a copycat mission, which is expected to launch in 2021. So hopefully that one will last a bit longer. We'll get more data, more observation, and a really cool understanding of X-ray spectroscopy, um, which is something that doesn't get done particularly often. But I was just saying um, that's a phrase I don't I don't remember you hear or remember you saying in quite a while. <laughs> yeah, but it should be uh, it should be really really good. So yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right, mm -hmm. we are running a little bit along on time, but I know that Tim Dog can speak very quickly, so we're still going to go ahead and do oh, this wow. story. Well, because I know you can. Also, I, I'm kind of a Rocket Lab fan, so there's a little bit of that. Yeah. It's my own personal motivation. Ben's not paying any attention. He's just pressing buttons. I've got control of the show. So, Mr. Tim, <laughs> tell me a little bit more about what's going on uh, with Rocket Lab yeah. in New Zealand. Yep. Well, exciting news for New Zealanders and spaceflight fans alike. The blackest rocket currently launching, the Electron, uh, is preparing for its second launch coming this December from the east coast of New Zealand. Uh, now, Rocket Lab had their first launch of the Electron uh, rocket in May, which was deemed a success despite not getting into orbit. Uh, ben, go ahead and roll the footage of it here. It's, it's pretty cool. Or maybe that video file didn't make it in there, but we do have a cool video of it. Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't have a video, but, Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. I only have that pretty image. But I'll, I'll give you that so you can read your script. There you Dang go. Dang it. All right, thank you. <laughs> we learned. Uh, so, uh. so despite the Electron not getting into uh, orbit, uh, and some new information, we learned that Rocket Lab experienced trouble tracking the rocket from the ground, which they, they deemed to be, uh, which at the time was actually performing perfectly. And out of an abundance of caution, they had to abort that mission uh, since they don't, didn't have the proper ground tracking. Um, now, Rocket Lab has yet to announce the exact date for their second flight. Um, they've dubbed it Still Testing. That's the name of the mission. Uh, the follow-up to their maiden flight, they tested it, that they dubbed It's a Test. I love their naming. It's awesome. <laughs> totally. Uh, but it sounds like it could go up as soon as December. So, yes, that's awesome. Uh, they seem to have a decent amount of confidence as they'll even be carrying a customer's payload this time. And how freaking cool is that? They're already flying a payload for their second launch. Um, Electron is only a small sat launcher, though, capable of carrying about 150 kilograms into a sun-synchronous orbit. And although it's really small, I really, really like this vehicle and the company. Uh, they remind me of a young baby SpaceX. They have a, a fun company culture. You know, they're, they're, they're whimsical. They have funny names. They have a, a rocket that has nine engines on the first stage, um, just a lot smaller than SpaceX. They're just they're cool and young, and they're flying from New Zealand. I just like them a lot. So yay, Rocket Labs. Good luck with this next launch. We're all cheering for you. So hopefully we hear more about it very soon. Yep. Totally. Yeah, definitely. Totally. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed, agreed. All right, great. So <laughs> that's our new segment. What we're going to do now is we're going to take a little bit of a break. Not that we need to reset because we don't. But when we come back, we're going to have a roundtable discussion about NASA's role very specifically in 2030s and beyond. So stay with us. There's more tomorrow coming up next. Somebody mentioned Ben and, or Ben, yeah, Jared and Carrie are not on the round side of the table. Maybe we'll fix that. In any case, I uh, want to make sure we, of course, give a huge thank you to our Patreon supporters. These, of course, the Escape Velocity Variety, as I mentioned earlier, they get a whole bunch of things, including like early access to our view only copy of the show rundown, so you can see what we're going to say next. Isn't that great? It's like seeing the future. And we also have our Orbital <laughs> Patreons. These people have given us $5 or more for this particular segment of this particular episode. They also get their name in the show in this segment and the next, as well as access to our exclusive Patreon-only hangouts and, again, so much more, including free worldwide shipping of tomorrow's swag store. Totally worth it. If you are interested in any of these things and more, go head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. I tried to do that my best Ben voice because, as it says in the rundown, for those of you who can see it, it clearly says Benjamin. Benjamin. 
<laughs> so there's Can that. I just say that you're doing a great job? You're a great host. I appreciate you, Karen. It, it's more like it's more like this particular episode segment of this. But, oh dang it! I can't do it. I can't even do it myself. Oh, it's, oh, the, all the buttons. The buttons confuse me. The buttons confuse me. He blew it. No he blew surprise it. The there. Finally screwed up the show. <laughs> <laughs> you say finally. He's that was you know episode one for those of you who uh, remember it and or have gone back and unfortunately watched it. <laughs> oh man, sorry. I've already broken Jared. I, that was not my intention. In any case, uh, so again, roundtable discussion, uh, a roundish table. We are around a half round table. I don't know. There's there's no good reason there. Uh, in any case, talking. I yeah, know kumbaya. Talking about NASA's role uh, very specifically. Uh, in the 2030s and beyond, uh, there's been a lot of talk, of course, you know, uh, forever we've talked about what does NASA do and what are they going to do? And what can they do and what should they do? Uh, and uh, 2030, I think, is a decent uh, m almost mile marker, if you will stepping stone, if you will. I keep looking at the wrong camera, if you will. Uh, where, uh, you know, it's 2017 now, or 2017, as some people for some, some reason like to say, gross. Uh, and 2030 is, is not nearly as far away as it sounds, and yet at the same time, there's a lot that can happen between here and there. So uh, I think there's a lot of debate over where NASA should be and what they should be doing. Uh, they went from NACA, which I don't remember the, what NACA stood for. Mm -hmm. Does anybody? Somebody here might, or somebody's going to look it up and let uh, me know. Uh, National, National ap uh, Advisory, National, uh, something, uh, it was like the Advisory Council is what the yeah. CA stood National for, Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. For Air, so, there you go. There you for go. Aeronautics. There it is. I'm reading yeah. a book about it right now, too. You think I'd remember? <laughs> <laughs> no, because, because like any, any, good, uh, any good acronym user, you say it out once and then you just keep using it after yep. that. Uh, and, and that's the kind of the way it goes. So uh, going from, you know, basically just airplanes and, and air force kind of stuff into aerospace uh, was kind of a transition for NASA in general and maybe uh, you know maybe it's time or maybe by 2030 it's time to expand or do something a little bit different right mm -hmm. so uh, first question we have here is should NASA even be designing rockets <laughs> who wants to take that one first? I'm going to start off off go to my rocket specialist I, first on that one I think we all have opinions on this so <laughs> this sure might be a good do. one to so uh, I have no problem with NASA designing rockets. Okay. I have a big problem with Congress designing rockets ah, yes. and mm. putting out the stipulations for what type of rockets NASA has to design. And that's how we've gotten in this situation with the Space Launch System. But should NASA be designing rockets? Sure, why not? I mean, if 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 the people at NASA aren't qualified to at least put blueprints together, then I don't know who is. Um, and especially if they are going to be doing contracts with multiple companies, I mean, I would love to see them, like, for example, Orbital ATK's just huge inventory of different types of solid rockets. They could put together so many different new types of rockets with that. Not that they would ever really need to, but... NASA should be the ones like designing stuff like that in just my perfect world where you know NASA is curbling together everyone's stuff into all sorts of new zombie rockets that would just be awesome but but I guess that's you know, an interesting I not to cut NASA's you off but there's so I think we all agree yeah. that that Congress should definitely not be uh, dictating what NASA is I think we're all just gonna say yes to that and if anybody else has any other opinions feel free to join those uh, put those in the chat room on YouTube on Facebook on Twitch on all of the different places that we are Wait, on so right we're, now we're all saying should NASA be designing rockets? No, but I mean, like, or, I think just simply okay. Congress should not be designing rockets. Yes. Period. Okay, good. So, so we're not going to debate yeah, that. Yeah. So should so, NASA be designing rockets? But Mike brought up an interesting a point that I think is very interesting is if NASA is designing rockets, you mentioned very specifically about NASA possibly kerbling, uh, you know, like how you use that as a verb, uh, kerbal space program for those of you who are not, uh, <laughs> Here we go. not familiar. But uh, uh, for lack of a better <laughs> explanation, kind of taking the, the different Lego pieces from all the different companies that make all the different pieces and putting those together into one rocket, would that even still be considered NASA designing a rocket then? If, you know, if company A is doing the engine and company B is doing the fuselage and, you know, if you have all these different pieces, is that really NASA designing the rocket? Does that make sense? You know, and I would almost counter that with, uh, can you actually say that NASA is really designing the space launch system, too? Because it's all being designed and put together by all the different contractors, you know, primarily Lockheed Martin and Aerojet Rocketdyne. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you could say the same thing about the situation they're in right now. 
So I don't know. All right, that's mm. totally totally fair thing. Anybody else uh, want to talk about NASA designing rockets? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. yeah. <laughs> uh, I kind of figured. I have a stronger opinion, honestly. Yeah. Uh, I I'm actually surprised to hear Mike say that because I I too agree that I, uh, NASA has brilliant people. They've been doing this for decades and decades and decades. Don't get me wrong. The people at NASA can sure design a rocket if they have to, but with cost, the problem is with cost plus contracting. I just don't see it making any sense to do that. And they really should be going mission oriented and saying, this is the payload we need. Who has a rocket and who can do it for the cheapest? Mm -hmm. They should literally be doing it almost like they were doing with the commercial crew program and letting people bid. And if they need to build a rocket to suit that, that's on them to do so. That's not necessarily rock or NASA sitting there going, here's the exact specifications for the rocket we need on this one. They're just going to say, Hey, we need this uh, 6,000 kilograms to go here and bid. Here mm -hmm. you go, people. Mm -hmm. Have at it, you know. And to me, that there's so many rockets already available. I mean, why are we still designing over and over each other? Um, it, yeah, just it's sort of like it, to me, it seems like if the um, who are the people that, that do all the road stuff in the United States? What's their what's that called? Um, like transportation. T uh, Department transportation. of Transportation? Yeah, sure, yeah, DOT. It'd be like the DOT had to design a car, you know, and they're like, sure. here we go. We <laughs> oh, have a car gosh. for everybody now. Just... <laughs> yeah, it'd be terrible. Right, right. Um, yeah, forget that. Like, That'd well, be like Soviet this... Russia, man. Forget that. Yeah, Oof. and to me, that's the, the bureaucracy of, of when NASA designs a rocket. No offense to NASA, because they do a great job, but it's, it's, it's not the people's fault. It's the organization and the way it's structured as a, you know, as an entity compared to a private company uh, from the ground up. It's, it's just different. And I still think NASA should be building the, and designing payloads, especially ones that don't profit, you know, to explore places. Oh, yeah. But that's what they should be doing and saying, here's what we need. It needs to go here. Now you guys bid on it. All right. That's fair. Jared, do you have a... Yeah, I just kind of want to piggyback on all of that, which is that it, it really is one of those things where, where, you know, just the contracts and everything that go with it. And one of the problems is, is just that politics are involved with it. It's right. always a lot of big politics. How much money can I get to my congressional district? Um, not necessarily how can I enable this rocket to actually do what it's supposed to do. Right. Um, and uh, uh, good luck getting rid of that that kind of thinking um, in Congress, because um, I know there are a ton of people who want uh, politics out of spaceflight. Uh, but I'll let you in on a little hint. Mm -hmm. Spaceflight, it was started by politics. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's it's been around since, what, 1957, politics and space flight? So mm. um, it's kind of a primary <laughs> motivator if you think about it. So um, it's going to be really difficult to get rid of that, especially if you're going to be federally funded. Um, then you just basically are automatically guaranteed that you're going to have to have politics and space flight, regardless of whether that's going to get you the rocket that you actually want or the rocket that you're going to build and maybe not fly. Sure. So, All right. Yeah. Interesting. So that kind of leads us uh, in a, kind of in the next question, which is, should NASA even be flying rockets? I mm. think that is lending itself to uh, the next question that uh, Ben prepared all of these. So thank you for that, Ben. Yeah. Uh, should maybe NASA become the FAA of space? I think those two are kind of really closely linked in my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take this I, one if you want. Yeah, um, yeah go ahead. I, I think that, you know, that's kind of my, my thing is I, I think that, yeah, I think that's exactly what NASA's role is going to be. They're going to be playing more of a an oversight role and not, a, a you know, a direct the person at the joystick role per se. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, and, and like Jared said, you know, you can't really remove the politics from NASA. But at the same time, the private industry, you know, SpaceX is a multi-billion dollar company now purely off, or not purely off, but mostly paying uh, customer payloads, you know, these days. Of course, they have NASA and some government contracts as well. But, I mean, they're making money on their own, and this is not that much different than when we were initially building airplanes, you know, and airplanes uh, were, like, for mail running and stuff, had a government contract, and that's kind of how you got the commercial airplane to be a thing. And soon, you know, p private companies came in and started building airplanes and designing airlines for, you know, that were profitable. And I feel like we're kind of right at that turning point where it's going to be less and less of NASA actually having to fly these things and more just overseeing everything. Interesting. That's so nice. the chat room uh, just exploded with this one. So uh, uh, interesting. Uh, so Green Jim Chu says the FAA for American space, maybe, which is interesting because the Neuropilot said the FAA is more efficient when they do as little as possible. Uh, we've got a couple other comments coming off of YouTube, actually. <laughs> 
so thank you guys for that. Uh, let's see, uh, Glenda Brondirk? I'm sure I'm probably saying that incorrectly. He says, no, NASA needs needs to be the R&D part of space fight like they do in aviation now, which is an interesting way of looking at it. Uh, Brooklyn yeah. Bridge says there's an argument for Congress to be involved, though, because of the get more or get money for the district approach. We have a space industry that is widely dispersed across the country. That's definitely a good argument there. Uh, mm -hmm. And then Zen Punk goes on to say, no, NASA is a better research organization, not an administrative space law. Uh, there's a lot to dig into, a lot of those things. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> I, just, yeah. I didn't want to pass yeah. by them because it was just coming at us fast and furiously. Uh, They're good, though. Yeah, no, really, really good. And, I, go ahead. And, you know, think about it like this for a minute. You know, when NASA, you know, first became NASA, a lot of the uh, Air Force rocket programs and stuff to start doing the Explorer and Discovery programs mm -hmm. uh, all started falling under NASA. And so a lot of all the early rockets, you know, were kind of being flown by NASA in partnership with the Air Force and the companies that were building them at the time. You know, they, they, NASA's never necessarily built stuff. Of course, they've assembled things and done lots of testing, but they've still had contractors all the way from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And after the, the moon race and after we retired, you know, the Saturn rockets and, and a lot of the other rockets before that, a lot of the other smaller rockets, if you will, the Delta family of rockets and the Atlas family of rockets still kind of went to more of the commercial side, even back then. And now, nowadays, ever since the space shuttle stopped retiring, you know, it, what we're talking about is exactly what's been happening. NASA has just kind of been, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the overarching authority or whatever uh, for all of these different United Launch Alliance and SpaceX and orbital ATK launches, um, whether or not they be for a NASA a program or a government program, um, or even if it's just a commercial program. You know, with all of, of SpaceX's commercial launches that they've been doing with all these different communication satellites, they still have needed NASA's help just for those launches. But SpaceX wouldn't have even gotten to the where they are now making money on their own without that government support in, in the first place. So I feel like we're already in that transition, and there's already this whole culture of getting away from cost plus contracting and have more of a fixed price contract just like the uh, commercial cargo and commercial crew. Mm -hmm. And with commercial cargo, it was just like how uh, Everyday Astronaut said, you know, we need 6,000 uh, kilograms to go here, figure it out for us. Right. That's exactly what the commercial cargo program was. And Orbital ATK not only developed a vehicle for that, but developed a rocket from that and did exactly what I was talking about, how they were pulling pieces from all these different places to make something new to get that 6,000 kilograms somewhere. So, you know, that's exactly how things should be. And we're already in the middle of that transition, at least in my opinion. Gotcha. Uh, Once yeah, thing, no. uh, things start flying with the space launch system, though, then that'll be, you know, all, all of that. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, Lur in the chat room uh, early on just said no to the question. And I said, OK, why? And so uh, Lur came back and said NASA's role should be to perform the bleeding edge of research in partnership with industry on the most difficult and high risk technologies, the things that are not profitable today, but can bring in return in 10 years or more. Um, I think that's very eloquently put. Yeah, and a, lot, and a lot of our a lot of comments in the uh, in the chat room are talking about NASA specifically the first A, um, yeah. which is aerospace, mm -hmm. so or aeronautics. Um, you know that is an incredible area that so many people forget that NASA has made tremendous amounts of contributions to. Totally. Um, both in civil aerospace and, and military aerospace and other things like that. Um, I mean, even some of the aeronautics research that they did uh, ended up uh, being added on to make uh, 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 semi trucks more aerodynamic. You know, like it's it's incredible the amount of research that came out of. Of NASA's aeronautics division, you know, um, I know that's rather relevant. Um, I was just talking saying, just, about semi trucks. Just, we'll uh, just uh, so. having been uh, mm. privileged enough to have gone to that reveal, I just that, that was <laughs> that was very funny. Yeah, to be, and, uh, um, <laughs> um, yeah, NASA's doing that right now. Like they're like they're working with Gulfstream um, to develop quiet sonic boom aircraft, um, things that reduce the pressure wave that you get from your sonic boom. They're also working on electric aircraft as well. That's one of the X planes that they're actually that's in development right now. Is literally an all electric aircraft to see what it takes to do something like that. And that's not something that we're going to have in five years. So an all-electric airplane isn't something you're going to get in five years. Right. But 15 to 20 years down the line, right. if Boeing or Airbus or whatever aerospace company wants to make an attempt to try to develop an all-electric aircraft, 
that research is going to be right there. It's available, mm -hmm. it's public domain, mm -hmm. it's put out there for everyone to use after its initial proprietary round um, with whatever group is doing it. Um, but that's, that's always been one of the key things to me um, is that NASA is that bleeding edge research organization that chucks all of its data out there for anyone and everyone to use. Um, it's, it, I, it, I, I, I'm not in agreement that NASA should be some sort of regulatory body. Um, the FAA can do that. No, so. it's, that's actually a, a really fantastic point. And this is, uh, I don't know how popular this question is going to be, but I'm willing to take the heat for it. Uh, should maybe NASA take its first A and its last S, like kind of go back to having a NACA, N-A-C-A, right? Mm -hmm. Having an aeros or an aeronautical and then also having an aerospace do you see what I'm saying? Like splitting. Yeah. So we have one that's only space and one that's, do you think there's any benefit to that in any way, shape or form? No. And let me, I would so. love to hop in real quick no, no. because this, this brings up a really good point and I, I guess I hadn't thought about it until right now. I, I did say, and I made the mistake of saying this, I don't think I agree with this now, but um, I don't think NASA needs to be the FAA. I'm just saying I see their role being that and definitely not only that. Um, and as Jared talked, you know, it reminds me, um, that for sure NASA should be doing a lot of the research and development for aerospace. And someone in the chat room mentioned too that, you know, we're going to be working on things that are, uh, you know, they should be doing the bleeding egg, edge technology just like they are in the, aer in the aerospace, or in the, uh, the other A, uh, not aerospace, that other one. Yeah. Aeronautical. Aviation. Air, yeah, that works yeah. too. Yep, yep. Uh, you know, they need to be working on, on that continually. Um, and. You know, I think it should almost maybe we should almost say that there should be a, a an entity similar to the FAA for aerospace that helps you know manage launch windows and all this stuff, kind of like the Air Force does with with ground tracking and all that. Maybe there should be just a body that does that. Is that um, doesn't so the FAA take care of that though? To, yeah, the FAA already does takes care of things like that. It's recently gotten I mean, more funding maybe to we be don't able to take it care of it better. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 that's, well, that's totally that case, fair. I think I, I agree that NASA should really just be doing the research, and that's their biggest value to us is, yeah. is continuing to push research and do things that may not be profitable and the exploration things, too, as well. Mm -hmm. Mike, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, in the same way that they are doing this this innovative research for airplanes and aeronautics today, they're still doing awesome research for that today. There needs to be more research on the side of how can we make rocket engines more efficient and, and make them as best as possible. How can we make better ion engines and and uh, uh, how can we make you know nuclear electric propulsion and, and just all these exotic propulsion things for space flight? How can we fly in space better? And how can we make better instruments? How can we have better communications? You know, really pushing that. And NASA is doing stuff like that for the space types of propulsion and communication and all that sort of stuff. But I mean, it's, you know, 1% of the budget compared to, to everything else. And you guys know how I love going through the budgets and stuff. And I really, you know, <laughs> highlighted a lot of those next step technologies where they only might have gotten a couple of million dollars for, you know, a really innovative, awesome, you know, possibly warp drive like mm -hmm. program that. You know, it's just getting a little bit, and I want to see more of that. So, as Sarge Enzyme in the chat room uh, says, uh, EM drive, uh, or questioning about the EM drive. Uh, so, I guess really to tie what Jared was saying and what Mike was saying, uh, that's kind of where my thought process was going. Is that if you maybe break out the. Uh, you know, the planes from the spaceships, maybe you could get more money because you, like, they could get some money and then they could get some money and they're not, not tied to the same organization. Does that make any sense? Because talking it about does. budgets, that's a, always a huge hot button. Uh, anytime we talk about NASA, budget, of course, comes up. Congress comes up naturally, uh, you know, but then budget is usually the next hot button that comes up with that. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that there would ever be a time where it would make sense to break those out in the idea that that maybe they could each have their own budgets and then possibly go on to do more and better things with that money. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, yeah, I see what you're saying. I don't agree with that because sure. there's a lot of crossover in aeronautics and astronautics. As uh, I think um, Tars in the chat room said something about like you have to go through the atmosphere in order to get to space. Uh -huh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. A don't get me wrong. The, That's why I'm asking though. A lot of the research that was done into hypersonic flight uh, was started by NACA, which was eventually taken over by, which was eventually turned into NASA. Mm -hmm. um, 
simply because you know the Russian, the the Soviets put that that uh, that small metal sphere in orbit. We have to, we got to beat them um, at all costs. Um, so yeah, um, I don't I don't think that they uh, should be separate um, simply because. Um, in some cases, they already are separate. Like, if you look at NASA Armstrong, they're really not doing a lot of, like, space flight research out there. They're doing, it's almost purely aeronautics that they're doing out mm -hmm. at Edwards, um, mm -hmm. out there. Um, and then you look at somewhere like NASA Ames, that has a mix of both. Um, and then you look at somewhere like uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory here in the LA area, mm -hmm. which, there's not a lot of aerospace or aeronautics um, yeah. involved in that there. So um, it, NASA kind of already has that with their different centers that they have. So I feel like further splitting it probably wouldn't be particularly effective. So. All right, no, that's totally fine. And fair. I can see what you're saying, Carrie, and I can see what you're saying about how, you know, it would, if you did split them up, like, they'd, like the, the people working there would be able to focus more on one thing or the other. Right. But another thing, since we brought up money, is that splitting them apart and creating new organizations and that the whole restructuring would cost so much money that it would hold things back in both areas for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. That's fair. So, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Uh, Tim, any other thoughts on uh, NASA budget increase, maintain, decrease, split up? Oh, I'm, I'm well, actually, yeah, now that I, I mean, I think the budget should maintain the same overall, mm -hmm. but I definitely think we should, uh, I, I, I want to see SLS fly, because it's so close, and I'm falling into that fallacy. I'm the one that's like, we're almost there, you know, right. the like, cost sunk fallacy. Are we actually almost but, there? You know. I, I, I knew Ben was going to say something. How dare you derail my show? Uh, <laughs> I was going to bring you up anyway. Uh, let Tim talk, and so, then I, we can counterpoint. I think the whole thing for me is, you know, if we spent those X, probably still another billion or two dollars that's going to go into the, to launch the one SLS uh, in 2020-ish, or even later now, I don't know, it keeps right. delaying. Um, but if, I think that money could be better spent elsewhere. Um, it, you know, that rocket's just too stinking expensive for what it's actually capable of, in my opinion. Now, correct me Sorry. if I'm wrong, I love because. It Oh, yeah, no, totally. Like, I, I, we do have a, a tomorrow, well, really, Ben Credible slash Mastin bet on that anyways, which is just something that we all want to see go through. <laughs> uh, we, just, we just want to see Ben lose. But um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. This isn't one of those things where, uh, like, uh, you give your four favorite children or your four children uh, an allowance, but if nobody spends any money on, you know, different separate toys, that they could all pitch in to get the one big gift and then everybody is happy. It's not one of those things where if you take, if you stop SLS, the entire Space Launch Systems program, and go, hey, we're not going to do that anymore, but we're just going to reallocate this money to everybody else. Like that's not the way that this works, right? Like no, the money is not. spent, it's earmarked for that, and it's that's where it's going, or it's dead. Yes, and uh, those Congress critters would definitely not be happy if uh, if right. SLS uh, was was uh, um, was canceled, and it is definitely not. Uh, above uh, uh, some members, um, if you will, to uh, withhold that money in spite, if you will. So, um, right. yeah, mm -hmm. it just, it's not the... going to end particularly well. Um, it's almost like, you know, the, the consequences of cancellation are almost unthinkable at this point with the amount of money that's gone into the program. Like, that thing needs to fly at least once. So right. that way we can then go, okay, it flew cancel this thing right so yeah <laughs> I mean like I, but, I, I can't think of a better way to describe it it's it's just horrendous I guess in the way everything's been managed so yeah and even well, even, I, and even I, as I awful and as expensive and everything that it's been it, something that I have thought about and like almost worried about sometimes is if we didn't have the space launch system and if all of the the Congress people weren't fighting over money and getting things you know sent to their districts and stuff like that, it makes me wonder if there'd be like any support for NASA. You know, all mm -hmm. of that money. You know, half the budget's going to SLS, and yeah, it's not like just like you said, it's not like it's going to be allocated elsewhere. It's just they're going to lose that money, and that's going to go to something else. You know, the military or a whole slew of other problems. And you know, if there isn't something like that that these Congress people can fight for to get money sent to their districts for their constituents, then they might not support NASA at all. 
And so mm -hmm. as big of a waste as Space Launch System is, at least we're getting the rest of NASA and the rest of all of the good stuff that NASA does. Can I throw as a hot take out there? Say. Can I throw like a like a near nuclear take? Sure. Out here? In my personal opinion, uh -huh. NASA should not be involved, not be involved completely in human spaceflight. I'm okay with NASA purchasing from private companies flights mm -hmm. if they need to, mm -hmm. but I'm not really particularly sold on total, absolute, 100% top priority goal of NASA being putting NASA astronauts in space. So, Why? Um, because I feel like with, with NASA's original emphasis in, in leading edge research and things like that, that that works well. I'm okay with NASA um, throwing money at a company in order to launch its astronauts and enabling uh, commercial space flight in that way. Mm -hmm. um, because because one, of the, one of the reasons that, that private companies have really been um, excelling of late is because they actually have a place to go. So they have uh, they have a a area to go to with um, with the International Space Station, both space with crew and cargo, mm -hmm. um, and soon to be cislunar space, um, mm -hmm. with some of the things that are going to be happening there. Um, I'm just not entirely convinced that NASA should actually technically be enabling itself for that. I'm okay with NASA enabling com commercial companies to carry its own astronauts, but I'm not 100% sold that NASA actually should have. A, a, I guess what I call a full-blown human spaceflight uh, program, if you will. So, I'm not against human spaceflight from NASA. It's just right. that to me, with the with the past 15 years. So remember, this has been right. going on for a long time, right. nearly 15 years now. Um, that uh, that that there is uh, a level of competency that that. Con the Congress will actually allow that to occur. I just so. want to clarify something really quickly because you, you said something and I, I want to make sure that this is exactly what you meant. Sure. Uh, you said something along the lines of uh, NASA, that you are okay with NASA funding and encouraging uh, commercial companies to fly their own astronauts. Do you mean NASA astronauts? Yeah, NASA astronauts. Okay, so, just want to be really crystal on I'm that I'm totally one. cool with NASA having a human, uh, uh, human space flight division, sure. but I feel like with, with, the, with what commercial companies have done with lowering costs and, and other things like that, that it's, it's significantly more enabled by going to commercial companies and having NASA astronauts fly on commercial rockets and commercial spacecraft, um, as opposed to yeah. having to be at the whims and... and Frankly, misery of Congress sure. as it has been. So that's okay. That's well, and I think ahead. it brings up a a point that you know, like you said back in the day, you know, human spaceflight was the cutting edge thing. It was mm -hmm. the absolute end goal of humans in space. You know, and and NASA's been there and done that, and then published how to do that. Now private companies are starting to do it. So why does that's one of those overlap things? Like you're saying, Jared, why does NASA have to continue to do that? when private companies are now capable of supporting human life and launching humans into space, right? Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to just get that out there, that mm -hmm. I, I agree. But I also really quick wanted to step back about the budget thing. Mm -hmm. And if you look at SLS as a jobs program, everyone included, I don't know how many jobs it is. It's probably in the thousands, spread throughout multiple districts, obviously. Um, you know, people that would say SLS tomorrow, we got a phone call, SLS is gone. How many jobs would it actually be per district? Are we talking about 200 jobs and then 600 jobs in this district, 800 in this one, 1,000 here? I mean, We're talking tens of thousands. It, I was just really? saying, Mike is definitely shaking his head on that. Mike, do you have yeah, I know insight what? on We're talking, We're talking tens of thousands. Yeah, it's big. So, Like tens of thousands per in district? one district or overall? Uh Overall, like I, I don't know what the exact number is or anything like that, but I feel like it's it's upwards of forty five thousand, and that might just be for one district. I don't know mm -hmm. if that would be for the the entire program as a whole, but it's it's up there. Gotta it's up there. Interesting. Yeah, that's bigger than I thought. Uh, I was gonna argue that you know, I mean, say they would cancel all those jobs, all those people that are very technical would be able to find placement and new jobs really quickly. And you know, maybe it'd be in the interest of some of these private companies to actually start building small offshoot. Maybe and this is against 100%, especially against what SpaceX does, which is put everything under one building as much as humanly possible. You know, but I, it's interesting to me. You know, if you built a, built a factory near Michoud, you know, you could just tell, you know, argue with Congress that hey, 
we're providing a place for all these people to go to build our rocket, which will be way cheaper for the taxpayer. And or, you know, you build one in Huntsville and and start absorbing some of those jobs. I don't know. I'm speaking out loud here, but that's you know what I mean? It, it's not worth it enough. The billions and billions and billions of dollars for SLS for 45,000 jobs. I mean, that is a lot, but that still could go so much further. Yeah, Lou's saying, I, go, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, don't forget, uh, SLS is basically copycat Ares 5. Yeah. So. Uh, Lur is saying that there's yeah. tens of thousands in just Alabama. Uh, Dutta says, how the hell are 45,000 people employed and not yet having built a rocket, uh, which is also a very uh, interesting way of looking at how it. The heck have we been, how the heck have we spent $50 billion over 15 years and still don't have anything to show for it? Yeah. We've got some <sighs> tanks and some cool welding equipment. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Rebel and some says, reuse <laughs> space shuttle engines. Rebel says, I think the word yeah. in all of this is management structure funding. I think this needs a full reform, and that has to be done in a multi-partisan uh, cooperation. Uh, yeah, which mm -hmm. is very, very true. So say, for instance, say, for instance, that uh, we, because we are supposed to be focusing on 2030 and beyond, and we keep talking a lot about a uh, space launch system. <laughs> uh, but say, for instance, <laughs> that we are past all of that, and we are now, that's definitely in the past. We've gotten through all of that nastiness, whatever happened there. Uh, you you talked a little bit about uh, the human spaceflight program, and and somebody in the chat room said something about, like, well, if, if NASA isn't going to be training the astronauts, like, who would? That's another area that I think, again, probably very unpopular opinion, and that's, I'm totally okay with that. Maybe taking that away, not away, but, like, out of NASA, breaking these into slightly smaller chunks. Or is that just a, I mean, I know you keep telling me it's a terrible idea, and that's totally fine. I accept that as an answer. Uh, but <laughs> But I, at the same time, I, I want to know why it's a terrible answer. Uh, is that still a continue to be a terrible answer if, if NASA is not designing their own rockets, they're not building their own rockets, they're not flying their own rockets to a certain extent? Why even train the, their own humans, if you will? for other people to fly them. Because um, to me, NASA's still going to do the cutting edge research that's yeah. involved. And um, and there's a lot of this research that NASA's doing that's not going to be enabled by the commercial market. Um, you know, uh, uh, to, <laughs> I, I always make this comparison, um, which is that Elon Musk, for all the money that he has, is not going to pay $3 billion to put a rover on Mars. Right. So he's not going to do that directly. Um, yeah. Jeff Bezos is not going to pay the 4 to $5 billion that a, a a proper Europa lander ice drill and submarine will cost. Um, that's where NASA comes into play. That's the kind of stuff that NASA should specifically be aiming to do. If NASA yeah. wants to do human spaceflight on the side, mm -hmm. that's a that's an okay thing to do as well. Um, because there, there, there will always be a bleeding edge in human spaceflight, and I don't have a problem with NASA, with NASA being funded to do that bleeding edge. Um, but the, the, I guess the problem for me comes in when the, when the private sector starts doing things at a cheaper amount than NASA does. That's where I start to have issues yeah. um, about that. And I don't think you're going to see NASA's astronaut corps ever go away, um, because that's just that's just too much prestige involved in having an astronaut core um, in your group. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think uh, spinning off astronauts from NASA is, is going to be a good way to go about it, simply because NASA, well, first of all, NASA has that expertise in operating. Yeah, but I'm not saying like right taking now, it so. away from them, but like taking all of that group and mm -hmm. just splitting it out. Right. Like I, I there's no reason to say, cool, NASA's not doing that anymore. But now these guys are interested in doing it and they've never done it before. Mm -hmm. You get to, you know, tomorrow isn't going to suddenly be training all the new astronauts. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But if you were to take the, all of that expertise and literally just scoop that part out and then make it their own entity with their own stuff, uh, as uh, Green Jim, Two in the chat room says, is training astronauts cutting edge research, though? Lots of countries have been doing it for years now, like we could totally have our own American astronaut training at. Uh, <laughs> it, it'd be like, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, it, it, kind of going back to the Department of Transportation, it'd be a way for NASA to make income and bring in money. If they commercialized NASA Johnson, Johnson Space Center, mm -hmm. and were a service that people could pay for to train astronauts, whether it be for commercial missions or other governments, you know, official missions, human spaceflight missions, mm -hmm. huh, that's an interesting idea. Are you talking maybe, about, maybe like, they should do that. 
Are you talking about maybe making like a potential a potential national test pilot school, but like national mm -hmm. astronaut school kind of program? Is yeah. that or kind international. of thing? Yeah. Or yeah, international as yeah. well, because this is it's definitely not um, any long duration That's mission that we do. Tra uh, astronaut training school. Yeah, that <laughs> I'd s sign me up. So <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and you know, we're talking about like building building new facilities in all of these different places where NASA's spread out, so that you can still get that Congress money. Why not just take over the stuff that already exists and commercialize it? I mean, the Michoud that's owned by Lockheed Martin, and Lockheed Martin has their own ambitious plans. Of course, they won't do any of them unless they get that government money. But the whole thing with all of the the hardware and the, and the new welding systems and all the stuff in Michoud to build the SLS is the same hardware that they want to use to build their crazy Mars architecture program. The Mars Base Camp thing I talked about like a month or two ago, you know. So that's an ambitious plan that they have. They won't do it unless they get government money. But you know, M Boeing has crazy ideas too. They have really ambitious plans. We all know that SpaceX has ambitious plans, and maybe we c could just like commercialize all of the existing space centers that exist. Not commercialize them like they're still owned by the government and stuff like that, but they could be used as a source of income for NASA so that we could do more things. Like I, I would love for NASA to be able to generate their own income or to even be able to like crowdsource stuff, like have an option on my ta taxes to donate an extra dollar just mm -hmm. towards NASA mm -hmm. or something like that. Like I would love that. And then they could probably do some really cool stuff. Tim Dodd, unless you have any uh, final thoughts, I think Destructor 1701 sums this up perfectly and then we will go to break. He says, uh, guys, what you're describing is the establishment of Starfleet Academy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm for it. Right? Nope. <laughs> yeah. That's I why we're doing I'm all this, right? right? We got to get to our Star Trek future. There you go. I, I Good. <laughs> Problem solved. Uh, I'm in. Nope. One round table down. Uh, we fixed NASA. Congrats, we did guys. It. Good job. Pat good. yourself on the back. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> I'm proud of all of us. So all right. Is that it's best. So, I, <laughs> I very much so look forward to all of your questions, comments, concerns, complaints, because I know they're coming. Uh, I look forward to every <laughs> last one of them so we can talk about them in next week's show. Honestly, we might just make that the next week's topic. Or, I'm sorry, not next week, because we're off next week because of Thanksgiving here in the States. Uh, but the next show, um, we, like I said, we might as well just make that the main topic, because I'm sure there's going to be plenty to say. But what we're going to do now is we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about all your questions, comments, complaints and everything about last week's show. Stay with us, more tomorrow up next. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know. Our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. Hey. Still me. 
Uh, <laughs> 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 we want to make sure we give well, it. Hey there. Hello. Uh, uh, again, another huge, really heartfelt, <laughs> honest thank you to our Patreon supporters. These, of course, are the Escape Velocity variety. They get all different kinds of things. And then sometimes they even get, uh, let's pick a different one. Um, naming all three shows, early access to After Dark as soon as it's available on demand. There we go. Then we move on to our Orbital patrons. They get their name in the show again. Early access to view only uh, copy the rundown as well. And voting rights and upcoming roundtable discussions. Wow, a lot of you guys get to vote on things. And we also have our suborbital patrons. These people have given us $2.50 or more for this particular segment of this particular show. They get their name in the show in this third segment. Exclusive access to our Patreon-only hangouts. And again, actually, even more than that, if you are interested in any of these things and more, because I can say that one more time, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. More. More. Okay. More things. Uh, so, yeah, for those Wait, of you who are more to say? Yeah, playing the uh, the drinking game as a... Uh, <laughs> thank you. I know you're done already. Look. <laughs> oh man uh yes please consider uh becoming a patron hopefully we give you as much as you give us uh because uh you're the whole reason that we're here so if we're not doing something you like let us know yeah. in any case uh so <laughs> questions comments concerns complaints about the previous show 10.43 Two, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Good number. Uh, I was not here, and I did not listen in on it. I only got to hear Ben's part of it, so I have no idea what most of these comments are about, so I'm going to lean on all you guys for that. Was my part any good? I have no idea. I wasn't listening to you either. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> At least he laughed. At uh, least you're honest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. All right. So first comment uh, comes off of YouTube from one Raymond Heath saying, I noticed that Dream Chaser was left out of the preliminary segment. Yeah, I noticed that, too. Don't worry about it. We got it covered this week. We did. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, see, I thought. That this well, actually, was... that hadn't happened yet. It wasn't it happening like right yeah. when you guys were doing the show. Oh, and like that's they didn't possible. upload, Sierra Nevada didn't upload any pictures or anything like that for a while. So, um, yeah, you, there wasn't really a way to talk about it last week. I wasn't here last week either, but. Yeah, Pic there wasn't like pictures or, or even any video until after last week's show. So Pixar didn't we happen. Saturday. Yeah. We all went to exactly. doing exactly. the drop test Saturday. So yeah. Everything happens yeah. on Saturdays. Everything important in space happens on Saturdays. Uh, what? <laughs> just so you know. Uh, but yeah, no, we covered it this week, so there you go. You're welcome. Uh, next comment comes off of YouTube from one Alan Brown. Comment on a comment on a comment. Can you come through the atmosphere off far out to sea and then fly in the last hundred miles as you also descend at a non-supersonic speed? I know at many airports they make you flatten out fairly quickly after takeoff and you can only climb after your past populated areas. Wow, yeah, this is like, this is going back a I'll, few, I'll eh? Take that one quick. Yeah, go right uh, ahead. I think he's specifically talking, we've had this discussion about the, the BFS, the big Falcon ship, the, the spaceship portion of the BFR rocket. Um, and there's an argument that you have to be almost 100 miles away for the, uh, for the sonic booms to not be an issue. Mm -hmm. The problem is the BFS has no way to glide that far, or really glide really at all in the atmosphere, let alone not only glide, but it does not have air breathing engines. It does not have enough lift to actually fly itself in for 100 miles. So it's just not going to happen with something like the BFS. Um, it could, I mean, sure. Actually, a good example would maybe be the Buran actually had um, mm. air breathing engines for transportation um, at times. And that was mm -hmm. a space, you know, space shuttle system that could have, you know, done their supersonic and the sonic boom somewhere super desolate and, and where there's no one living. And then it could have actually flown itself into a uh, touchdown, uh, you know, I don't know how far away, but it could have done that. Um, but this, and uh, that's exactly what now, they did. An option. Yeah. And this is not an option though. For yeah. BFS. That's exactly what they did with it. The, the reentry approach on the Buran for the, the only space flight that it had wasn't anywhere near the, the, the runway that it was coming down and then fired up the jet engines that it had included to be able to maneuver itself and propel itself over to that landing trajectory and <laughs> land just like an airplane, like even slower than the space shuttle landed. I thought that the, the, the I, Test article of Björn had the air breathing engines, but not the actual flight vehicle. 
Yeah, itself. I didn't know the flight vehicle. I could be wrong, but it. I thought that the flight vehicle had jet engines as well. I don't know. I could be wrong, though. If so, that's awesome. I did not know that, and I hope it's true. Well, let's find out. Oh, man, Buran was so much better than the American Space Shuttle. So much better. Just ah, <laughs> such a shame. <laughs> it is a shame. All right, well, yeah. <laughs> we fixed Ross Cosmos as well, so. No problem. I should yeah. host every Production show, app. apparently. Uh, <laughs> next question, <laughs> next comment comes off of YouTube from Anti-Fusion. Danger there. Uh, commercial crew, Virgin Galactic going live. SpaceX Moon Trip 2018 is looking breathtaking. Yeah, super excited. Yeah, buddy. See, I, I don't want to be the bummer so. person on, on that particular comment. Please be I, the bummer person. I feel like I've been helping out with this show for nearly 10 years now and i feel like every year we say that uh but the thing is i guess that's why they say uh perspective is 2020 right so uh you know it feels like it doesn't feel like anything i mean not not every single year but i feel like there's a lot of years where it's like oh nothing really really that big happened this year and maybe you go oh this one thing was really big or maybe this these two things were really big or like i don't know this is the start of something in it but then you look back and you're like oh man like five years ago we weren't landing rockets and now when spacex doesn't land a rocket it's like oh i can't believe they just put that in the ocean what were they thinking like that's such a terrible <laughs> thing like this has been going on for decades you guys uh so yeah. you know again like i i, I don't want to be the bummer but i'm like eh, yeah i mean I guess cool sure if you say so uh, I'll believe it when I see it you know all those sorts of things uh, but I, I, I do believe it when I do see it if that makes anyone feel better okay uh, is am yeah. I right in thinking that I don't think the moon mission the SpaceX uh, you know trip around the moon I don't think that's gonna happen in 2018 now I thought I heard someone already say that they got pushed back to 2019 maybe I'm wrong I would imagine maybe Falcon Heavy has to fly a significant number of times in order for yeah. that to be a viable thing, so I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm not willing to be the guinea pig on that so. one, so there's that. But uh, that's just me. <laughs> that's just me. I know we usually fly, yeah. fly mice, not guinea pigs. I know. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. I would turn to either one of you. I would turn to all of you for that kind of answer. I don't know. I'll be the flying monkey for that one. Heck right. yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right, though. On paper, at least, though, 2018 does look like it's going to be a very exciting year. Whether or not all these things that we're expecting happen or not is another story. And I think that's what you're you're kind of bringing up, Carrie Ann, mm -hmm. is every year, you know, we've looked forward to and expected, you know, awesome things to happen. And some of them might not have happened and other things might have taken us by surprise. And, and yeah, I think that even just what we were expecting, you know, five or even 10 years ago, ago and where we've gotten to today, I don't think a lot of us really expected things to be how they are. A lot of amazing stuff has happened, but the amazing things that we were expecting to happen still haven't happened yet. Yeah. So, and yeah, we'll, we'll see how things go, but I'm, I'm excited one way or another. 2018 does look good on paper. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Uh, next comment comes off of Twitter from Biohacker. I seem to remember these things being available faster than this one. Uh, I seem to remember these being available faster than this one, sorry. I demand you give me free, high-quality content as soon as possible. Uh, I believe that is in <laughs> talks with, or talking about uh, the space pods in particular. There are some times that we have to schedule space pods at a particular time because sometimes they're very timely. You don't want to say, hey, congratulations on that Nobel Prize when they didn't win it. Uh, even yes. Though, right? <laughs> there's, there's that. Uh, and then there's other times where people, I don't know, go on vacation and we have to sort of push things off a little bit so yes absolutely sometimes things get ever so slightly delayed blame it on ben uh, i believe that is the live a... show didn't go up till like wednesday right uh and sometimes <laughs> there are just quite literal technical issues as k mccoy in the chat room likes to say watch live yeah uh and then you'll get it as soon as possible as soon as it leaves my mouth yeah. it then it's yours so 10 seconds later well yeah ah, ah. Yes, the bridge is laughing about that one. Uh, <laughs> very true. And then, you know, after that, I can't take it up back. Uh, in any case, so, yes. Yes, it's true. We have normal lives, too. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Uh, just stuff happens. I apologize. Uh, but as soon as it is available, it's all yours. So there's that. Next comment comes also off of Twitter from one Sam Price uh, regarding P2P BFR. So a point-to-point -point big Falcon point -point? rocket. Here we go again. 
Oh, <laughs> with so much spare Delta V, couldn't it stay subsonic whilst near cities? Deeply throttled during takeoff until far enough away, take a tabletop flight path versus parabolic so descent is slower, etc. Mr. Tim Dow, the everyday astronaut with more than one M in your name. Do you have any comments on that one? Uh, yeah, the realistically, um, no matter what, as soon as you throttle down, you're wasting Delta V. Um, and they're going to have to for human flight because humans don't like, especially grandparents and, you know, people like that. Experiencing three to four Gs of acceleration is not going to happen. So they're going to have to throttle down pretty low to almost two Gs. Right there, they're wasting Delta V or losing Delta V. Um, the vehicle, they won't, they aren't going out on some big, giant, hyperbolic arc. You know, they aren't going out like this. And uh, there's really no such thing as the Earth spinning um, or below it because they start off with that same velocity as the Earth's rotation. Um, so really, they're going to be basically going just shy, only a couple, in some cases, probably only like 200 meters per second slower than orbital speeds, which means they're going to have to use all of that orbital velocity anyway. And... Uh, to get on the same trajectory in order to do, a, a, like, say, a, an entirely around the backside of the Earth. Um, it honestly ends up almost being as much Delta V to do a flight like that as it would be just to put itself into a, a high parking orbit, um, at least according to what people have been trying to do in, in Kerbal Space Program, which I know is a terrible excuse. Uh, well, we know how <laughs> you spend your time now. Yeah. Saying, yeah, saying that it, it honestly will take almost as much Delta V to, to do it that way, so... Uh, no, I don't think there's enough remain uh, remaining left over to throttle down a lot and and do what they were saying. So, all right. I also got to say, it, uh, this is probably going to be a lot like commercial aircraft too, where you're going to load that thing with as much stuff as you could possibly put on it, um, and mm -hmm. uh, with an airplane. Um, the the fully loading of a of a vehicle powered by a rocket is significantly more um, impactful on things like range and and speed and altitude and things like that than it is on an it's on an airplane. Yes, it impacts an airplane, but with a rocket, every ounce counts. Um, so um, those rockets, uh, the the point to point BFR rockets, uh, they will I would imagine um, they will likely not have empty, a single empty seat on them because one, everybody's going to want to fly one, um, and two, um, you are going to maximize the amount of payload that you are carrying over a maximum distance, um, and you know any spare delta V is going to be eaten up um, with with enough re a reasonable margin for delta V, um, but most of that's going to get eaten up by the fact that you're going to carry the maximum amount in order to uh, effectively get a, a significantly more profitable flight out of out of uh, out of a rocket. So. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Uh, so I want to make sure I give a thank you to even more Patreon supporters. Yes, even you mm -hmm. get your name in the show, uh, giving us anywhere between one penny and two dollars and forty nine cents. You get your third or your segment. I can't talk. You get your show. Your wow! I really can't name in, <laughs> the, name show. in the show during, during the, third the third segment. segment. Wow! All of those words and more. <laughs> access to our exclusive Thank Patreon you. only hangouts. Early access to After Dark as soon as it's available on demand. Again, star star. Even if that means on Wednesday. Uh, and uh, and our our. <laughs> Our deepest gratitude, really, really, really. Every single mm -hmm. one of you uh, help make the show what it is. So again, if there's anything that we are doing that you don't like, please let us know. That doesn't necessarily mean that we will change it for you, but we will consider it nonetheless. Okay, one other gentle reminder. Oh, sorry, uh, go to patreon.com, slash TMRO. Uh, that's something that Dada would not let me do, but Ben apparently did. Um, we are not gonna be on <laughs> next week <laughs> because yep. uh, of the giving of thanks that we do here in the Americas. So. Uh, I'll for, be in a food coma. I'm sure so. most of us will be. I'll probably be shopping, honestly. Uh, in any case, <laughs> just keep that in mind. We are off next week. However, we will be back December 2nd. Uh, we'll be uh, at least here in the U United States. <clears throat> uh, we will be back for that show. I also want to give a quick shout out to Mickey Mouse. It is his birthday today and a happy belated birthday to my own personal superhero, Mr. Randy Smith. In any case, uh, stay uh, more. There's going to be After Dark coming up next. That's the end of our show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you guys for being here. And thank yeah. you for letting me talk as much as I have and actually listening. I do appreciate that. Uh, see you guys in a week.